Good evening. And thank you so much for this tremendous opportunity uh, to be here tonight. It's quite a privilege to be able to speak to you as part of this plenary session um, in support of the 236th meeting of the Electric Chemical Society. My agency, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, is well known for its pivotal investments in technologies that have greatly impacted our everyday lives. DARPA's ARPANET, designed and developed to enable researchers at universities to have greater access to scarce resources of computing uh, power, was a predecessor to today's internet. DARPA's early investments in art artificial intelligence, including natural language processing, led directly to the spin-off technology that became Siri, that's in many of our Apple iPhones. Similarly, DARPA's early investments in miniature GPS receivers for military applications played a significant role in the later development of commercial GPS technologies that we all enjoy in platforms such as Waze and Google Maps. These are just a few examples of high impact DARPA technologies. Tonight, I'd like to focus on another high impact DARPA investment. And that is the role that DARPA played in establishing and advancing the field of material science and engineering. And along the way, as part of that story, I'd like to highlight some examples of how DARPA investments led to both major advancements in electrochemistry and solid state technology and or leveraged advancements in electrochemistry and solid state technology to make breakthroughs in other disciplines. I'm gonna start by providing a brief introduction to DARPA and its history. I'll then discuss some specific contributions DARPA made in material silence, again, many of which played and continue to play important roles in, in advancing foundational science across many disciplines, including electrochemistry and solid state technology. And I'm gonna include with a look to the future and some opportunities for innovation in electrochemistry that may address some ongoing and future important national security challenges. DARPA was established in 1958, a few short months after the launch of the Soviet Sputnik satellite. It was a time of great angst and uncertainty in the United States. People wondered, what did it mean that another country a perceived adversary had achieved a technological capability that the US could not replicate. DARPA, DARPA was established out of that sense of angst and urgency in order to ensure that that sort of technological surprise never happened again in our country. Our mission then, as it remains today, is to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. And here on this in the chart before you, you can see a timeline where along the bottom, we've listed some of the technology, te technology investments that DARPA has developed into capabilities over time that are shown along the top of the curve. Again, DARPA's mission today remains the same as it was when we were first created. And we maintain that sense of urgency through the way we create and organize our investment portfolios. DARPA technical staff, program managers, DARPA leadership like myself are only brought in for a very short amount of time. People come in with a passion to make a difference in technology for the world and they only have a very short time to execute on that passion. So people are um, 
very excited to come to DARPA and get things done very quickly, and that's one way that we maintain that sense of urgency. The mission of DARPA has remained constant. Our investment portfolio adapts and changes over time in response to changes in the national security threat landscape. So here you see the current uh, focus of the DARPA portfolio in terms of missions that we are looking to uh, enable and sustain. We want to defend the homeland against existential threats such as weapons of mass destruction and terror, cyber attack. We want to be able to prevail against high-end adversaries by enabling our military to project power from afar and to adapt new and more distributed postures in how we, we actually execute our missions. And of course, we want to maintain a robust space presence. And finally, we, have, we recognize that our military is continually being asked to uh, perform missions that are beyond what it was originally uh, designed to do. There's our expanding roles in stabilization and deterrence and peacekeeping. And we need to develop the technologies to allow us to be successful in those missions as well. And in addition to these very mission-focused areas, DARPA has a very significant portion of its portfolio invested in foundational science that supports technology development across all of the, of the top three mission areas. And some of our larger foundational in initiatives include alternative computing, next generation AI, biotechnology, and next generation electronics. To optimally execute the mission-driven portfolio, shown in the previous slide, DARPA is organized into six technical offices shown here. Two of these offices on your far right, the Strategic Technology Office and the Tactical Technology Office, are focused on the development of platforms and the payload systems and mission, mission planning tools to optimize performance of these platforms in and across multiple domains. The remaining four offices are focused on more foundational technology development in support of the DARPA mission priorities. My office, the Defense Sciences Office, is unique among the other offices in terms of both the diversity of our people and the diversity of our programs. We are the most forward-looking office across the broadest landscape of technologies. And we like to think of ourselves as serving as DARPA's DARPA in that we look to invest very deliberately and strategically in science and technology that we will believe will help inform the future investment strategies for other DARPA offices and more broadly for the entire Department of Defense in the future, maybe five years, 10 years, or many decades away. So in terms of DARPA's mission to invest in early pivotal breakthrough technologies for national security, DSO's investments represent some of the earliest of those early pivotal investments. DSO is currently the longest continually operating office within the agency, and we were formed out of early materials research projects that were initiated very soon after DARPA was established. And in fact, in this chart, you can see that DARPA has had a long history of advancing the field of material science and engineering with many of these investments coming out of my office, Defense Sciences Office. And I'd like to call your attention specifically to the very uh, beginning of this timeline uh, where you see the, uh, the interdisciplinary laboratories that were funded by DARPA from 1960 to 1972. These long-term forward-funded grants were put in place after the US President Advis Scientific Advisory Committee recommended an interdisciplinary approach was needed to advance materials research for space and military technology. Again, keep in mind the, the um, context and the background that in which, under which DARPA was established, these same factors of uncertainty and angst over uh, loss of a, a, um, ability to uh, deploy technologies that other countries had developed uh, was driving a lot of this. The first three awards under the IDL were put in place by DARPA in 1960 at Cornell University, University of Pennsylvania, and Northwestern University. 
The following year, an additional eight uh, university IDLs were created, and in 1962, a 12th IDL was created at the University of Illinois and administered by the Atomic Energy Commission. The IDL program ran from 1960 to 1972, at which time DAR ARPA, it was originally ARPA, changed its name to DARPA, and the IDL program was transitioned to NSF, where it was renamed the Materials Research Laboratories Program. And eventually, the Materials Research Laboratories Program ended, and the NSF Materials Science and Eng Engineering Centers, or MRSIC, program was established. I've highlighted on this slide some of the foundational work, uh, a very small uh, uh, ex uh, exemplar set that came out of the IDLs, including some very important research enabled by and or advancing electrochemistry and solid state science. ARPA's and DARPA's early investments in the IDLs uh, are largely credited with establishing the field of material science and engineering as a distinct discipline. And one measure of the impact of the IDL investments is the increase in the number of material science departments at universities over time. In 1964, there were 11 universities in the US materials science departments. This increased to 51 in 1985, and there were over 100 by 1989. I'd now like to transition to highlight some of the research my office, DSO, has supported specifically in the areas of electrochemistry. But before I do, I'd like to briefly um, uh, describe DSO's approach to advancing fundamental or basic research to support um, more applied research with an eye towards building capability for national security. Our office looks to fund fundamental to uh, or basic research all the way through the full spectrum to applied research. And we do this across many disciplines. And when breakthroughs occur, we then look to rapidly exploit these uh, to address the national, these national security priorities. So in other words, we do fund a spectrum of research ranging from very fundamental to more applied research. And in the next few slides, I'd like to highlight both basic and applied research that DSO has funded that either exploited or produced advancements in the fields of electrochemistry. And I want to stress that these highlights are just a small sample of important advances funded by DSO and more broadly by DARPA. DSO has a long history of investing in batteries and fuel cells, with a few of our past programs shown here. Some of our investments were actually in lithium ion battery techno uh, technologies and chemistries, uh, along with other uh, DOD components. And many of these were some of the earliest work that uh, ultimately has been recognized uh, with this year's Nobel Award in Chemistry. And we have, uh, as you know, one of those awards, awardees here today. DSO investments also allowed for significant advancements in portable fuel cells for military applications. And there were a lot of firsts that came out of these investments. For example, uh, there was the first demonstration of a fully integrated portable direct methanol fuel cell, and the first demonstration of a fully integrated portable solid oxide fuel cell, and many other firsts that involved first demonstrations of operations on logistic fuels for the military. So shown here are some of the early uh, depictions of DARPA's vision for how we could reduce the weight burden of the individual soldier by replacing heavy, heavy batteries with portable fuel cells. And as the plot on the right shows, there was a huge and rapid advancement in the single cell power density uh, after the start of the DARPA program. There was a lot more work done uh, as part of this and, and follow-on programs uh, to build the balance of plant, to deal with challenges such as water management that um, arise from this particular type of fuel cell. But the first fully integrated um, demonstration of a, a direct methanol fuel cell came out of DARPA investments in the early 2000s. Unfortunately, we were a little bit ahead of our time, and the military wasn't quite sure how it would use 
a methanol fuel cell given the, the fact that it uses pretty much JP8, a different uh, fuel for, for most of its applications. DSO also funded the early development of a portable solid oxide fuel cell technology. And we produced similar results in terms of rapidly advancing the state of the technology. Um, this is particularly noteworthy because at the time we started these initiatives, the conventional wisdom was that you would never see a self thermally self-sustaining solid oxide fuel cell below about a kilowatt of power. Uh, there actually was a lot of pushback and what we were doing was perceived by many as folly. But the reality is we actually uh, persevered forward and uh, a particular uh, microtubule design for solid oxide fuel cell did achieve, uh, well, and we also had a, a planar version as well, did achieve uh, self-sustaining operation. The, this particular version, the microtubule-based solid oxide fuel cell, I'm going to show in the next, uh, next slide, actually advanced to the point where it was transitioned to a real capability. The, what you see here are some of the early demonstrations of a fuel cell powered UAV that achieved endurance, flight time endurance, that more than doubled the state of the art with the lithium ion batteries by which it was normally powered. This technology is now uh, available in the Lockheed Martin Stalker extended duration uh, uh, UAV. Now, what I haven't shown, and what I'm, was it, what I'm not going to talk in any detail about uh, due to time constraints, is that DARPA also looked at fuel cell technologies for other applications, including UUV energy storage. And there, again, the development of both the fuel cell as well as all of the balance of plant requirements, which are particularly stringent when you in, are in a uh, closed, uh, swap-constrained environment. Um, made great progress and were transitioned to the Navy, who continues to develop these technologies for its next generation uh, underwater unmanned vehicles. I'm also not presenting uh, any slides, but I do want to mention that in terms of solid state energy conversion, DARPA had a very long and sustained investment, particularly in the area of thermoelectric materials. When we started this, uh, this investment in the 90s, along with the Office of Naval Research, the figure of merit, the state of performance of, of, of uh, thermoelectrics, the business telluride materials, had been stagnant for a number of decades. The sustained investment over another 15, almost 20 years, led to a number of advancements in the materials. The materials performance were almost doubled. Today, we uh, continue to work to try and trans translate those materials developments into de device improvements. That's been a real challenge. It continues to be an ongoing challenge. Many of these materials are not in bulk form, they're in thin film form, and they've required us to rethink how we actually build devices out of these materials. So through programs like DSO's Matrix program, we are looking to try and solve not only the material challenges, but the integration into device devices as well. I'd like to transition a little bit to another area that, that uh, DARPA and DSO in particular has invested in fairly heavily uh, in the early 2000s. Corrosion has been and continues to be one of the um, um, major challenges for our military. And our Structural Amorphous Metals Program sought to leverage the uh, chemical homogene homogeneity of amorphous materials, the lack of defects in these materials provides fewer locations for corrosion to precipitate. And the advances uh, that we achieved in, uh, under the uh, Structural Amorphous Metals Program show that we did achieve significant corrosion resistance. We sought to further develop uh, these materials for specific applications under our High Performance Corrosion Resistance Materials Program. And here we were able to show both through experiment and computationally that these materials um, were very stable uh, for many thousands of hours. So um, the, 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 the advancements that we achieved under, uh, under these programs 
Uh, we're very promising, and the Navy has, has ta since taken the technology and continues to develop uh, these materials for specific applications on their platforms. However, as I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit, we have by no means solved this problem. This is an area that uh, we still are, are tremendously challenged, and we believe that uh, um, your community is where, uh, where we're going to find solutions in the future for these problems. As I'm nearing the end of my talk, I'd like to highlight a couple of current efforts that DSO is funding that are leveraging advances in electrochemistry for the discovery of new molecules, as well as new approaches to direct right nanoparticle arrays. So under our Molecular Scaffold Design Collective, we have been learning that electrochemical synthesis routes are often faster and produce higher yields than other approaches. This is important because we are entering an age where we are beginning to understand how we might leverage advances in artificial intelligence to greatly accelerate our ability to explore um, a much larger space of, um, of molecules for, for many different applications. And in order for us to do that, we need to be able to, at the same time that we design these new molecules, we need to be able to synthesize them rapidly and with high yields. So this is a very important investment that uh, we've taken some baby steps into under this smaller program, but we anticipate uh, investing uh, much greater resources uh, in the near future. Our nanoparticle mediated bio bipolar electrochemistry uh, technique is something that was developed under a program called Atoms to Products. And in this program, we recognize that we are very good at building materials at the nanoscale and below, and we're very good at building materials at sort of the mesoscale and above, but trying to capture some of the extraordinary properties that we observe in these nanomaterials in a bulk device uh, is challenging because we don't have the tools to, to build them into those larger materials and devices. And so that was the, the nexus of the uh, the Adams to Products program, and this one uh, particular approach uh, uh, was, was developed under that program, and it's really enabling us uh, to, to consider how we might actually truly engineer materials with functionalities, electronic and, and photonic functionality and multifunctionality uh, at scale that we have not been able to imagine before. So we continue to face many important materials challenges and that are going to be uh, critical for us to address for our national security. And we believe that there are many opportunities for advances in electrochemistry and solid state science to address these challenges. I've shown a list here that is by no means comprehensive. It's a, um, a list to help foster some discussion. Um, we would love to have better batteries, uh, but we'd like them to not be uh, hazardous to take on board our ships, and particularly we would like them to be flame resistant. Um, we, uh, we are looking for novel propulsion techniques and new uh, energetic materials for propulsion and energy storage and generation. Again, I mentioned our work to try and leverage AI for discovery in chemistry, in particular new molecules, for many different applications. Uh, new coatings, again, corrosion remains a huge challenge for our military and commercial industries. Uh, Biofouling, again, in maritime environments is a huge challenge. And we have many cases where we need better uh, barriers um, to the different thermal stresses that our platform see. And then finally, we think there's opportunities for entirely new material architectures, again, to uh, enable new approaches to thermal management and new uh, hierarchical uh, complex material systems that may provide us both functionality and multifunctionality that uh, we've not enjoyed before. So uh, I'm gonna come to the end now and hopefully take some questions. But I'd like to conclude my talk by emphasizing that in all of our investments, DARPA aims to produce disruptive impact. And to do that, we seek to work with those in, research, in the research community 
who are able to think with a revolutionary rather than evolutionary vision. And I think this slide really highlights the type of researchers that we really desire to engage with in our DARPA programs. So at this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention, and I am happy to take any questions as remaining time allows. <laughs>